Good afternoon, good evening, and early good morning. So this is really depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Jean Yang. I'm the director of Kelly's Institute for Corporate Governance. Um, so we have been existed since 2004, and the mission for the uh, Institute is really to promote research on corporate governance related issues and to inform policymakers and to change or influence organizational practice. So we have launched this series of public lectures on corporate governance in November, 2021. Today, we are on number 20 of this whole series. So we tackle classic questions like corporate board, CEO compensation, um, insider trading, and so on. We also present challenges uh, that brought in by a new environment and new technologies such as climate risk uh, and data and security. So the series has been hosted by uh, European Corporate Governance Institute, ECGI, and I use Allstrom Workshop. So in our series, we have several lectures that cover ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance related issues. Our inaugural lecture given by Alex Edmund in November 2021 has the title ESG, Do We Need It and Does It Work? If you know Alex, you know the answer is yes. And Laura Starks from Texas covered climate risk and institutional investors in March of this year. And a, a marketing professor, Professor Paharia, covered the ethics of consumer choice back in May. And today this is, uh, well-needed overdue lecture on greenwashing. Uh, ESG investing at a crossroads, given that we've been doing ESG related research for so many years, and there are hundreds of research papers on this topic, should we look back to examine, do they, uh, they could be corporations, could be fund managers or asset owners, do they walk the walk or do they only talk the talk? Forthcoming, we're gonna have uh, reading agencies. So on February 1st, uh, Jess Cornell is going to talk about certifi certification agents, including ESG rating agencies. And in March, Carolyn Flymer is going to talk about ESG for the system level investing. So all our public lectures are hosted in the uh, ICG blog series. Uh, the address is listed below. So the next lecture is on the governance of certification agents on February 1st by Jess Cornardia. Please take out your device. This is the QR code, so you can put it in your system. I'm gonna stop here briefly. All right, I'm going to introduce today's moderator. Uh, actually, Jenny and I are in the same room, uh, upstairs of NBERs. <laughs> 1050 Massachusetts Avenue is a tiny room. We may look at each other from time to time. Jenny was my colleague at Indiana for uh, six years. Uh, she is a social professor of finance at Georgetown University's uh, Madal, Ma 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 Dano, sorry, School of Business. I know I butchered it. Uh, Jenny research focused on area of empirical finance with many areas. Uh, she started from financial intermediation. She does labor and finance from supply chain relationship, and she does more and more of the ESG on the uh, S side, uh, on, on the E side, as well as the G side. And Jenny research has been published in many top academic journals like JFE, RFS, Management Science Review of Fairness, uh, JAE, and Attention Review. Janet is associate editor at Review of Financial Studies and Journal of Financial Intermediation. She has helped uh, the American Finance Association in mentor young scholars, uh, young woman scholars, uh, she had made sub substantial contribution in that area. Uh, she graduated from PQ University for her uh, bachelor degree and her PhD is from Cornell University. Now I'm going to pass this to Janet to introduce our speaker for today.
Thank you so much, Jim, for giving me this honor to introduce Pedro. Uh, so let me just start by the regular, um, regular process. Professor Pedro Matos is a chair professor of business administration at Darden School of Business, University of Virginia. He's also a research associate at the European Corporate Governance Institute and the academic director of the Richard A. Mail Center for Asset Management. As you can see, he's a very busy person. And this is because he's such a productive, prolific researcher in the area of corporate finance. He has over 20 top journal publications and over 13,000 citations. As we all know, this is an incredible achievement and many of us will look up to that. So in terms of his research area, uh, broadly his research uh, would be belong to the uh, areas of asset management, investments, corporate governance, and international finance as well. But in terms of specific topics, he covers, um, he's an expert on the role of institutional investors, but also branches out in many other important areas, such as banking, the labor market of CEOs, m and and so on. I remember reading Pedro's work when I was a PhD student and always felt quite inspired by many of these good ideas. And in recent years, Pedro has been devoting more attention to ESG related topics, um, including the effectiveness of sustainability investment and the role of responsible investors. And in today's talk, he's going to discuss this really important and ongoing issue, um, given the current trend and also controversy re regarding sustainability investments, given that there has been more and more pushback in different parts of the country, as well as over the world. How do firms and managers respond to it? What should the investors expect? These are all very important and relevant topics, and I'm very much looking forward to it. So now I'm going to hand the floor to um, um, Professor Meadows and uh, start his talk. You have the floor. Great. Um, thanks, Janet. Can you guys see my slides? Okay. Well, thanks again so much for the invitation. Um, very pleased to be here and talk to you about ESG. ESG has been in the news uh, over the last few years a lot. So you think back like even three years ago, ESG was or 2021 was um, labeled the year of the ESG. You had record flows into these funds, ESG stocks um, outperforming activism uh, with firms like Exxon, regulations from the EU, et cetera, to like 2022 when, you know, these things were starting to break apart a little bit. This is a cover of uh, The Economist, three letters that won't save the planet. That was the subtitle whistleblowers uh, talking, accusing the industry of greenwashing, becoming more skeptical. And the economist was saying it's best to focus on E, uh, so to line up these private ESG initiatives on climate change with government action. To like what we're seeing just this week, which is uh, headlines this week in the Financial Times, uh, talking about the shut slowdown and outflows of ESG. Um, it, w is this just a market correction? Are we after overdoing it, or are we seeing more regulatory scrutiny? Uh, this is political backlash, as Jenna just pointed out. So um, the Wall Street Journal, for example, says uh, it's actually been a bad year for clean investments and many uh, evidence around green neum sort of going out. But this is not just this two, it's per very pervasive around many uh, press outlets. So very good time to look into this to the, the ESG team. But also another reason to look into this is this week, uh, we're undergoing the COP28, the Climate Action Summit in Dubai. And there are some reasons to be pessimistic about what progress have we actually made. Um, so this UNEP emission gaps report that's um, subtitled Broken Record finds that the world is heading for temperature rise far above the Paris Agreement. And I don't know if you guys can see a small dip that existed during the lockdowns in 2020, uh, but it's, you know, it's come back as things stand. Um, Government commitments will still leave us within 2.5 to 3 degrees above pre-industrial levels. That's higher than the 1.5 degrees centigrade that the Paris Accord uh, asks for. Uh, again, reasons to be optimist would be uh, 
for example, the Wall Street Journal, which wasn't so optimistic on, on as I just showed you, um, there's been really um, costs for renewables have plummeted and the growth is exceeding expectations. So the IAE, the International Energy Agency, has underestimated the growth of uh, some of these things like, um, you know, um, renewables, you can see for solar, for wind, for electrical vehicles. Alongside renewables, you need storage because this, this might be intermittent. Um, uh, sorry, and coal is also being eroding. And for storage, uh, you're also seeing improvements in terms of the the cost of um, of this, um, you know, storage technologies. And finally, um, many markets, the cost of switching from uh, small, mid-sized EV uh, from to from a gas gasoline-powered vehicle. Uh, it's already occurred in places like China. It's occurring in Europe as we speak, and we, we might get to that point in, in the U.S. So there's a lot of reasons to be half empty and half full. So it's it's really very, um, very um, good time to talk about this, as I said. Um, this this colors here might, it's very eloquent way to um, represent the long-term temperature trends. Uh, they're called the warning uh, uh, strips, stripes, sorry. And we're seeing a large spectrum of opinions also around this. So uh, you could look at this as new data, right? This temperature rise, new risks and opportunities. And if we, we just, like the cartoon suggests, we just threaten our existence. You know, a lot of people may be, you know, uh, disengaged from that. But if we bring up that this could threaten our investments, a lot of investors may tune in and think, well, maybe uh, we need some new investment styles or new methodologies, new risk management systems to deal with this. That's fairly neutral, but some um, might go a step further and, and call this a philosophy or ideology. And I don't know so if you see this tweet, Twitter feed from Elon Musk saying that ESG is a scam because Tesla has been cut from S&P ESG index. So some would even say this might be nonsense. Um, so the big thing I think I really want to focus on is this concern around greenwashing. So there's some definitions here about what greenwashing, you can also have blue washing and rainbow washing and other, not just uh, on the environmental dimension, but sort of making false claims or misleading statements around the sustainability profile of financial products or service. And this can erode the trust on ESG investing. And the reason I, I, I did say we had three years was last year, 2022, we had a number of scandals. So in, in Europe, you had a formerly Deutsche Asset Management, the DWS group being investigated by the German regulator. Uh, whether they were greenwashing, incorporating or not ESG factors into their uh, products. Uh, the police raided their offices, the chief um, resigned, and they uh, were levied uh, heavy fees. And in the U.S. as well, you had um, SEC uh, investigations around um, greenwashing at BNY Mellon. I actually took this picture uh, at the day that news came out. And if you went on BNY Mellon at the day of the news, they had actually, you know, seen through greenwashing on their own website, like they that uh, they were advocating that people should should be concerned about greenwashing when they were themselves being accused of uh, greenwashing. And and Goldman's also has been um, levied some. Uh, penalties on this. So here's my outline. I'll talk about um, some of background on ESG investing that's informed by uh, a literature review I wrote for the CFA Institute and talk about um, a first paper, some evidence that not only ESG investors may be walking the talk, particularly in the US, and this suggests some greenwashing. The main reason being there might be conflicts between this commitments and their fiduciary duties. And then um, talk about whether even if you do walk the ESG talk, which is what we document for mostly European investors, that may not result in a real impact. And, and we'll look at that within the context of climate change and finish up with some takeaways. And let's see if, how much I can do this as I flip through high, quickly uh, some PowerPoint slides. So um, some um, 
just some disclaimers are this is very messy and hopefully I think the, all this scrutiny is just um, healthy those of skepticism and my my goal here is that we sharpen the focus and really advance this um, it is some caveats here is that I will focus more on my own journey and I do want to thank all the my co-authors on this journey but there are a lot more papers out there uh, that I'll cite, some more uh, good surveys, including Laura Stark's uh, presidential address last year, which I highly recommend. But also, as June pointed out, a number of the series that uh, Cali ICG and ECG is running on, on this uh, webinar series. Um, I would warn you that even I'm not a climate scientist and so many others, so we all are somewhat um, subject to this competency greenwashing, you know, like I don't want to overclaim our findings here, but uh, the best way I, I think to suggest that is to read through what Alex Edmonds has in his Twitter feed, which is, you know, if you focus on a particular story, it may not be true. If, if you bring up a fact that is not data, that fact needs to be representative. Data may not be evidence because in, you know, uh, may not, and evidence may not be proof because it may not be universal. So, and even if you documented causation in one setting, that doesn't mean it applies in every other setting. So I would just always warn us to take every uh, study in context and, and uh, not overclaim. So what is ESG? Um, I think most people are familiar with this, but it's increasingly assessing portfolios based on non-financial data or investments broadly on environmental impact like carbon um, emissions, pollution resource use, on social concerns like firm relations with workforce, customers and communities on G. Uh, those are more traditional uh, topics in corporate finance. How line is the company with the interests of shareholders? How independent is the board managing con uh, incentives, etc.? So we can think about uh, SRI, ESG, this, all those reduction of this risks and leveraging private to address these um, concerns that are kind of sustainable development goals. You see those boxes down there. Um, and who's driving the focus? As I mentioned, some investors like BlackRock coming out in January 2020 with a um, letter by Larry Fink saying that in, this is a fundamental reshaping of finance, State Street, Vanguard, but also corporations talking about ESG, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, the statement that came out on the purpose of a corporation um, that would put out, uh, you know, value to customers, employees, suppliers, communities before uh, shareholder value. Actually, the Council of Institutional Investors pushed back on on some of that. So I will um, just say, you know, there's been many high-profile scandals over the last 20 years. You can remember uh, Enron, uh, BP Horizon, um, oil spill, the VW, VW Dieselgate, and Facebook's um, pri data privacy uh, bridge. And also, you, of course, you have more over this last couple of years with the pandemic. So I, I think it's you know it's risen up. And officially, there it's been coined in 20, uh, 2004 with the publication of the UN Global Compacts Who Cares Win report that the three letter ESG, but this chart from the UN's PRI, Principles for Responsible Invest, gives a history going back to ethical investment by Quakers, other religions and denominations all the way going back to SRI efforts uh, to end the apartheid in the 1980s to the launch of the PRI, as I mentioned, uh, subsequently in 2006. And then the Paris Accord of 2015 and a lot of the initiatives that came out of that, like Climate Action 100 and the COP26, so two COPs to go, you had the global uh, Glasgow Financial uh, Alliance for Net Zero. Uh, what's driving ESG financial materiality is like the relationship with that this ESG is just good hard performance. So some some clients may be driven by the potential to control the risks of this ESG being material or enhancing returns, that there's a high debate over the, whether that can happen or not, or whether that can be only transitory. Some other clients may have broader social um, value uh, values, um, goals. And this is a classification that um, Laura Starks talks about it in her, in her presidential address. So I highly recommend uh, going back to that. And they might be, you know, 
shifts in social landscapes or even evolving investor preferences that are pushing, you know, for these values to be uh, reflected in investments. The big word here is really that, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, policy and regulation coming out, and I'll talk about this later, disclosure, stewardship codes, taxonomies. But the big word here is in the US is uh, this concern around fiduciary duties. What is that? Ensuring that those that managing other people's money do so with appropriate care, skill, and loyalty in interest of the clients or the beneficiaries and consider ESG issues not uh, in, the, in that course. Now, this is crazy, but this was the first President Biden's veto during his years was when the GOP led anti ESG legislation was coming out and he wanted to defend the Department of Labor understanding on ESG being allowed into the, um, uh, the RISA plans um, consideration. So, so this has risen up to become political as well. Um, ultimately, as I said, we do care about uh, whether this all these efforts are, are managing um, to deliver on the sustainable development goals or the Paris alignment. And I will talk a lot about the PRI. So there's this, this initiatives around these principles. One, one issue I always have a concern is it really depends how you look uh, to figure out how big is ESG. Like a lot of academic studies truly just focus on, on mutual funds in the US. And they, there's a lot of overclaim, I think, by those academic studies because that is actually the smallest drop in ESG money. It is only three hundred billion dollars in the U.S. Now it's a it's several you know hundred billion dollars, but it's in a in the realm of capital markets. That not that's not a a big number. So that dark uh, green on this picture that's the cumulative on the left uh, AUM, and that's only three hundred billion in the U.S. The large majority actually resides in Europe, and that's more like uh, close to two trillion. Now, it is true that uh, ESG funds have been more resilient, whereas in the U.S. has actually been some outflows. But the outflows in the U.S. are, you know, two or three billion per year. It's not or quarter. It's not really uh, that big. And it is true some are removing ESG related terms uh, in the U.S., but but not in Europe. So that would be a very narrow you know, even if you combine European assets, that's only two trillion. You could take a wider lens, and this is the GSIA, Global Sustainable Investment Alliance, and they 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 have a much bigger number, like thirty trillion, um, and that is actually shrinking from thirty five trillion. Uh, this number just came out a few days ago, uh, and their last report two years ago had been higher. So it's interesting because there's a lot of been some pushback and some reclassifications uh, bringing bringing this down. Okay, the wider, and I've I've been told to slow down by some of the <laughs> some of the members, so I'll do that. Um, the wider lens is this PRI. The PRI is this uh, principles I'll focus on next, and they they can talk about uh, over four thousand signatories and five thousand, I, I believe, right now, and uh, over a hundred trillion in assets. So, depending how you define ESG and what um, in, you know. Um, incorporation of ESG, you, you can get different numbers and can reach different conclusions at what is the impact of this ESG. So I was very interested in the topic myself, as I said, and I started working on this first with a survey and then two joint projects with um, uh, quarters in Geneva, um, Rainer Gibson and Philip Kruger, Tom Steffen, and also postdocs here at the Mayo Center at the University of Virginia Darden School, Simon Glossner, who's now joined the Federal Reserve Board, and um, Vasca Atadarqua, who's just about to finish her postdoc here. And I was really interested in how much is there really, um, what is the extent of uh, ESG adoption? So let's go more uh, slowly now. So I decided to take a look at the PRI and what is the PRI is this initiative and this is the picture when it was launched um, to leverage the private sector to, you know, 
come alongside government efforts. And this is what was launched by the United Nations, knowing that uh, our you know, commitments to sustainable development goals were not being achieved just through government action. And so the idea is that um, the, the signatories sign up to these principles. The first one is that they will incorporate ESG issues into investment analysis. Number two, they'll be active owners. Uh, and number three, they will seek disclosure, dot, dot, dot. And more importantly, that they will report, um, principle number six, they, they will report their activities and progress um, implementing this principle. So that's where I will be privileged enough uh, alongside my coaches to first look into this data. Now, I showed you the, the growth curve uh, before, the exponential growth in this initiative. It's become the most influential organization in this space. A lot of the signatories tend to be concentrated in Europe, but there's also big pockets here in North America, Asia Pacific, LATAM, etc. cetera. Um, some of the, you know, you'll recognize some of these names. This data is from the 2019, so pre-pandemic assessment report data. They did change the methodologies a little bit, but they are more recent data from the PI every year. Um, and so you'll see that a lot of them are, uh, in, in number, a lot of them from Europe um, and um, a lot of the, the assets that they report on are equities and fixed income. Now, I'll focus more on equities because we have more data on that. But in the if you read through my CFA literature review, you'll also see some statistics for fixed income. So um, how does this PI signatories um, you know, implement that principle number one of incorporating ESG into their investments? This is a taxonomy that the PRI, the GSIA, which I mentioned before, or the CFA Institute uh, have sort of gravitated towards, which is you have to make a decision when you buy a security or a decision when you sell a security. So let's start from the end. That sell decision would be a divestment decision. Therefore, you're not doing ESG investing with that security anymore, right? But if you're doing... Uh, um, uh, a buy decision, you can negatively screen. That's very pervasive, as I will show you. Uh, certain sectors, companies, or practices, you can choose a best in class, um, or you can use some uh, norms based investing, um, and or or have a dedicated strategy, just which is called thematic investing, just on clean energy, green technologies, uh, sustainable agriculture, water, etc. Integration, where is you incorporate everything into this, all these factors into the financial analysis. So you don't exclude anything or focus um, on, on anything, but for every investment you make, every uh, risk management decision you, or monitoring you do, you integrate ESG. Or finally, engagement, which is the idea that you are um, going to try to change the ESG practices of the companies that you're invested with individually through uh, you know, um, engaging with those companies, uh, filing shareholder proposals collaboratively through initiatives like the PI collaborative platform uh, or internal voting, which is like your, you know, decision to vote and not outsourcing that, for example, to a service provider. So what do we find? Uh, we find negative screening is the most popular, the purple colored there. Uh, the thematic is, is still niche. And a large fraction are reporting integration and engagement, but it's very murky what that really means, right? Um, now, this is what uh, economists would call the extensive margin, who reports that they do. But if you look at the intensive margin, which is how much of the AUM do you actually deploy these techniques, uh, Europeans tend to do a lot more than, you know, um, on screening, for example. Thematic is niche, as I mentioned, and there's some more uh, um, disclosed uh, or reported um, integration. Engagement, there's no data there on the intensive margin. So with that, I'll turn to the more detailed study that I did with some quarters here at UVA and the and University of Geneva, um, which is whether the signatories of the PI that are reporting this level of 
uh, incorporation, ESG incorporation, what is it that they do in terms of their actual portfolios and is there or not a disconnect between what they report and what they do. Now, we would not be the first study, but I'll leave you with some references here if you want uh, to, to go back. Um, um, but this is the first where we were mapping these two things, the reports to PRI and their portfolio. Um, their portfolio data. So here's the report, for example, for BlackRock. Um, they they joined the they signed this in 2008, and this is a report, for example, for for um, a given year. Uh, and there are different modules here. Mo we focus mostly on the direct listed equity incorporation. This part here, and for example. Um, only on those um, indicators that are mandatory to report and disclose. One, one big one is the one I showed you before, is what is the percentage of the equity portfolio that you apply ESG? And the answer for to that for, for uh, BlackRock is that 61% of the UM is not does not incorporate ESG, only 30% does integration. This is our small numbers on your screen, I apologize. 4% would be uh, screening, for example, but the majority of the assets uh, do not, they report are not uh, taking into account GSG. And mind you, they do a lot of, um, you know, they have high shares, a lot of passive products, etc. as well. There's a, a different module also for passive incorporation, but um, but then BlackRock against us get uh, compared with other signatories and they get a score actually. How are they doing in different things? In listed equities, for example, they get a, a plus, they might not score so well in fixed income, et cetera. And they voluntarily display this, this score in their website. This is not mandatory to, uh, but um, this data is, you know, at, the, at its prime two, three years ago, everyone was trying to report good scores in terms of uh, ESG incorporation on, the, on their websites. So we, we look at the PI survey, that's data set number one, as I showed you before. Then we, we co um, combine that, map that to equity portfolio holdings around the world. This is some work I've been working with Miguel Ferreira and many other co-authors over the, the year uh, from FactSet. Uh, with institutional holdings around the world. So we might have Allianz uh, Bernstein, uh, then they might hold, let's say Volkswagen, Novartis and Exxon. And then the third data set we combine is three leading raters, ESG raters, MSCI, Refinitiv and Sustain Analytics to compute a portfolio ESG score. In other words, how are the stocks sustainable as measured by um, a consensus of these three raters? Although we did do independent studies for each of them, uh, the results were, were fairly consistent. So what what we see, a growth in PI signatories, I was showing this picture before, in blue would be the non-signatories, uh, institutional investors, in green are the signatories. Uh, in number, they've grown to several hundred, 600, I believe, and then growth in AUM, 60% um, of the assets, they're super large investors like the Black Rocks of the world that are more than uh, one in every $2 is now a signatory of this uh, initiative. The growth was faster in outside the US, and now it's very pervasive, 75% at the end of our study um, and 50% um, uh, still in the US. But these numbers have grown since the, the end of our study. So that first question was, are the signatories uh, walking the talk or not? Do they exhibit better portfolio footprints uh, than the non-signatories. And outside the US, the, the top panel here on this table shows you that, yes, the, they do walk the ESG talks in terms of incorporating. But interestingly, on the bottom panel, um, sorry, the other way, on the bottom panel, the non-US, there is a positive loading. Or uh, if you look at the curve on the right, the, the, the signatories in, in green are to the right of the non-signatories. But interestingly, the, in, in the US, the top panel, I should say, um, there is actually a negative coefficient, which if anything suggests that they actually have worse scores than those that don't. Uh, so why is it that they have less um, worse ESG scores? And is there a concern around you know, greenwashing. So we wanted to go into this, but we wanted to leverage also the, the data I showed you around 
what level they were reporting, were they screening, were they thematic, uh, were they doing integration. So we look at what's that first part of incorporation, although we conducted some study, some tests around engagement where we didn't find much evidence there. We are mostly focused on the first part of the asset allocation decisions. And on that, the US signatories, that that bad result of the US signatories having US um, um, lower ESG scores, that is concentrated on a lot of signatories that actually don't even uh, report any, <laughs> any level of incorporation. Um, and that is why we might be inclined to label this as evidence of some greenwashing because they join this initiative, they don't even report any incorporation. Uh, and and they tend to have worse scores. Whereas in outside the U.S., those that report partial or full incorporation, full being 100% of the assets um, have one of those screening, integration, or thematic, then they are more aligned. That is, their scores tend to be higher than uh, their portfolios allocations tend to be more sustainable. Okay, and uh, so a big question for this study that this study leaves us with is why is there this difference between the US and the rest of the world? And the commercial motives in the US would be, you know, one reason. One reason we document in the study is that uh, US institutions are rewarded by particularly retail flows by um, retail clients after they join the PRI. Now, institutional investors, institutional clients, I should say, they do a lot more due diligence and they actually don't just get, let's say, fooled by joining the PI. But at the early stages of this, we do find a bump in, in, in uh, fund flows after institutions join the PI. And this is particularly true after they recently underperform. So if they're struggling with performance, one way, and, and there's a lot of competition these days with passive and indexing, one, one way active managers can kind of bump their, their assets would be to join this, this initiatives like the PI. That's one reason. The second reason is this big debate around the fiduciary duty that I just mentioned before. During the last year of the Obama administration, the DOL introduced the, the, the a ruling saying that you could incorporate ESG considerations, but then in the Trump administration that got reversed in 2018. And with Biden, it just got added back in. And then Biden, the Congress was trying to, you know, rule that back and then Biden had to veto. So all this regulatory uncertainty, I think, exposes a lot of investors to some potential litigation risk or um, that um, may, um, you know, may therefore um, limit their, their incorporation of ESG. And the, the way we, we tested for this is we actually used a, a shock that occurred in the UK, where prior to 2014, uh, the UK had was not allowing as well ESG incorporation, and then they clarified it. And we subsequent to that, the PI signatories uh, started more walking the talk. So this is predates the, the, the discussion here, but that was, um, um that was um um you know uh like a, a definitive t a task that we did there and then finally um and there's a lot of similarities just in the common law environment in uk and the common law environment in the us so maybe in there, the evidence from the uk can somewhat speak to the to what's happening might happen here if we get more clarity in the us and lastly is also the us is a little bit behind as i showed you that the, the the EUM by the PR signatories is increasing, but it's increasing faster in other markets compared to the US. And so there's more peer pressure um, uh, in the other markets uh, to walk the talk versus markets like the US where there's been still uh, lower penetration. So first study uh, conclusions is there's in the US, there's a large disconnect between commitments and portfolio outcomes. And this is maybe consistent with greenwashing outside the US, words and actions uh, are more aligned and we observe better footprints for the signatories that incorporate fully or partially ESG. But I think, again, there should be more research examining this differences uh, across the, 
you know the geography uh now <laughs> the the funny thing about this uh the paper is published now in the review of finance and then uh, was featured after it came out in the special issue of their rf it was featured in the economist magazine and the subtitle there was dubious green funds are rampant in america and i happened to be in the pri conference <laughs> the day this the the weekend this came off and the title um of the article was pretty strong you know uh why i would have labeled it different i would say you know why not USG investors are walking the talk outside the US. And there's three reasons why the US are not. Uh, and they, if you read the article in The Economist, they do go, walk through this, but uh, it's a little bit more bombastic. So anyways, my message is that it is important to, uh, you know, be there, engage with with the, some of these uh, institutions. So I'm myself, Laura Starks, and a few, uh, Caroline Flammer, we're now part of the academic network conference and the committee that is trying to bridge these conversations between, um, you know, industry and practice. So I think it's very important to bring this uh, healthy dose of skepticism and um, and dissecting, you know, which signatories might be doing or not. And this shakeout from greenwashing and hype um, is a good thing that it will make clarify who's really doing ESG and um, and equipping investors with a toolkit to to succeed. And also professors and students like all of us as we you know learn more about this. Um, there are many other studies around this. I will just highlight a few, uh, three, uh, two studies, on, contemporaneous studies in the PI documenting the same thing. Kim and Yoon just has a more limited sample just for the US equity mutual funds. They also dis, dis, uh, document this uh, disconnect. Liang, uh, Sun and Teo for hedge funds. They also document that hedge funds may be overclaiming. Uh, but there's some success uh, in Dimson, Caracas, and Lee with the coordinating engagement, something we did not look in our study, although those those are, you know, um, some of the, the, one of the biggest thing, um, um, coordinating engagement is the, the climate disclosure project, which is the next study I'll talk about uh, briefly. And then the colleague, my um, Frank Go and Lynch to my colleagues here in accounting in, in at Darden, they have this, I think, um, article in management science of voting on shareholder proposals that there is some alignment between the PI uh, signatories and, and their voting. So there might be some disconnect on the ESG incorporation in the portfolio. There might be more connect, connect on the engagement. And this is an evolving space. And this might, you know, as these things work out from 2017, the end of our study tool to now, there might have been already some evolution on this. There are other papers on greenwashing, impact washing, I list here, uh, not just by mutual funds, also by banks. Uh, we can talk about that uh, later. And then greenwashing by corporation, I would highlight the paper by my moderator, Janet Gao here with Ranju Shin and uh, Chi Jinping Xu on sustainability or greenwashing evidence from asset market. It's a very interesting study of how, you know, publicly listed uh, entities may be divesting toward, to privately held corporations because this more increased transparency that ESG and other concerns are bringing to uh, publicly listed entities may be pushing these assets out. And then our next uh, webinar, our uh, Jess Cornardia, I think is also talking about earnings, ratings uh, management uh, and um, and uh, so, you know, lots of interesting work also on conflicts in ESG rating agencies. So uh, as, a, uh, as a response to this, uh, there's been, as I said, a push for more standards. So the CFI has come out with standards for their members, their voluntary standards. Um, for example, but and, but there's also been regulation at the EU level with sustainable finance disclosure uh, regulation SFDR for for the investment managers for the corporations. They're called corporate sustainable uh, directive CSRD, and then uh, the EU taxonomy, um, which I'll talk about briefly in the end, which is designating activities that are green or not. Uh, in the U.S., you also have an updating, uh, sorry, there's been more enforcement, as I showed you uh, on ESG, um, um, there's a task force, 
and there was also uh, an update of the 20 year old names rule uh, that you shouldn't overclaim if you have used the word sustainable or ESG in your fund that said you have to show that the investments are aligned with that. There's a, this is from a few days ago at um, Morningstar in the, um, webinar. There's a lot happening here in terms of it could be disclosure, could be portfolio requirements, could be global labels, could be um, naming rules, etc. And it is not just happening in the EU and the US. The EU is probably the the strongest. Uh, and for example, SFDR I mentioned before came into force in 2021. Uh, and fund managers are required to disclose more information and they get kind of into classified into Article 6 uh, who don't integrate ESG to Article 8 that promote ESG and Article 9 that are, you know, targeting ESG an, as an objective. And there's been a lot of, um, you know, um, readjustment of um, money, you know, and, and reclassification also of funds from A to nine, et cetera. So there's some working papers on this. I highly recommend uh, taking a look at this uh, because there's been this re a wave of reclassification and, but this is very recent work and still very much uh, active. So let me talk maybe in the last few minutes here about the second study, which is more specifically focused on climate change. And uh, it is again with quarters uh, here at uh, at Darden and my, Philip Kruger at um, Geneva, and this is much uh, more working progress. So this is not a peer review publication; it is more um, you know uh, working progress. So um, as I mentioned, the start of the with uh, COP twenty eight, you know, there's this legacy of you know warm that that you know. Um, the U.S. and the industrial nations be responsible for the accumulation of, of um, carbon emissions, and it is um, um, scientific consensus around the need to uh, reduce those emissions such that we meet the, the Paris Agreement goal of staying below 1.5 degrees centigrade. A classic example of externality. The first best solution here would be a global government tax, you know, uh, but coordination is is difficult to achieve on this uh, so Tirol and and Lasse Pedersen have uh, papers around this so that there's been some pressure on the industry okay so why is this you know even you know the US goals and the more importantly the European goals to get to net zero China's goals which is you know China is now 2x the carbon emissions of the US they're very hard to achieve and that leaves us with that you know that emissions gap that I, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk uh, that we, you know, government action is unlikely to fully deliver on those promises, but also uh, even those promises would not leave us uh, close to the 1.5 that we would need to do. So the, the idea is to leverage, therefore, the, um, the private sector and um, investor uh, initiatives like the CDP and climate action. So what is CDP, Climate Disclosure Project? One of the initiatives from the PI was to launch this initiative, um, uh, you know, together with other partners uh, to get questionnaires to companies to start reporting their carbon, uh, GHG, um, sorry, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, then also um, have more information around targets, reduction of their emissions and, and pathways. And then the climate, with that list of, you know, you, you can learn that uh, emissions are fairly concentrated. Then there was an initiative after the Paris Accord to engage with those companies, and that's called Climate Action 100, the top 100 companies, now 100 plus. Um, and I, the theory behind this is this idea of investor coalitions sort of substituting um, for a central planner. Um, now, there are some challenges, and uh, I recommend reading the theory in the, around that, but uh, that would be ultimately the goal to have like uh, coordinated actions on this. So as you think about the prom, uh, you guys can see that um, that chart there, the emissions of just the uh, industrial usage, it's it's more like 40 to 50 gigatons. Some some emissions are more from forestry and agriculture. They're not outside the reach of, of most investors. But what is interesting is the emissions that come from um, 
companies that are listed in public markets, they only represent in aggregate 10 gigatons of the 50 gigatons per year. It is true that they're fairly concentrated in three material sectors, oil and gas, utilities, metals or materials, uh, but even ExxonMobil, like a large oil and gas, is only a sliver, you know, it's less, it's like 0.3 gigatons or so per year, or RWE, a utility, large German utility company, or the largest steel company like ArcelorMint, or they're very small. So this is something to be aware that all these efforts by institutional investors in public equities may only address like a fifth of the total, you know, problem. And if so, if they are trying to do this, are the, how are they going to um, achieve this de decarbonization of their portfolios? Is it by exiting, uh, you know, just uh, tilting away from the large emitters, or is it by voicing and engaging with those um, brown companies to become less brown over time? And finally, are they actually helping the transition beyond just this emissions? So. This is what we wanted to do. Again, a very thriving area of research on this. Um, uh, you know, on climate finance, several papers by Bolton Karpischik and, uh, you know, um, uh, Taylor, um, uh, etc. I will just then, you know, uh, walk, walk um, uh, straight to the, the mention the initiatives uh, from 2005 uh, Onwards, we have data on the CDP initiative, and from post pairs, we have data on the, the Climate Action 100. We tend to focus more on what's called direct emissions, scope one emissions, but we also conducted some tests with uh, scope two and three. Um, and we combine the data of the signatories, like have they joined or not these coalitions, with the same portfolio data that I showed you in the in the previous study, the facts at institutional holdings. But instead of look, looking at ESG scores, here we're looking at uh, corporate level emissions so that we get a carbon footprint or a carbon metric for an investor's portfolio. We have more study, uh, tests around targets and green revenues and patents, but I may not be able to do that. So the first thing I wanted to, you to take out is this picture of like, if a, if a company, if let's say BlackRock owns 1% of Saudi Aramco, then we're portioning 1% of its emissions to BlackRock. So as it as its a carbon footprint from that investment, but 90% of the Saudi Aramco might still be owned by the Saudi government or PetroChina there still might be a large uh, part uh, held by the, the Chinese government or Petrobras in Brazil, etc. So there's a lot of companies that are still closely held or publicly listed. So if you look at the, if you take the total emissions from those companies, we are somewhere between 10 gigatons at the beginning of our sample to the end. This is the companies that get covered by S&P True Cost, the data provider. So it is bigger than the economist numbers of 10, it's more like 15 gigatons by our measure. But if you look at the institutional portfolios in the aggregate, they only hold about you know three gigatons or, or so of the total. And that is because uh, the more polluting companies are still closely held because they might still be state owned or you know maybe have some legacy uh, state ownership or family ownership, concentrated ownership. There's another part that is floated but is not held by institutional investors. So it's interesting because total uh, emissions, these are just the industrial emissions we leave out agriculture and forestry. It is growing from 30 to uh, 37 gigatons on the left chart, but but um, in institutional financed emissions or institutional portfolio um, carbon footprints are, are pretty flat. And that is very interesting because institutional holdings on the right, you can see that institutional holdings have grown from 43 to 53% of market cap. So this already tells us that institutions must be decarbonizing relatively to other investors. Right to retail investors or to controlling block holders, or as Janet and other works suggest, maybe it's also there's another phenomenon between publicly held, um, you know, entities to privately held the the chunk that is not in public markets. 
this is also true if you look uh, at the more um, widely held stocks, uh, large cap MSCI equity stocks, there it's already flat. Like those companies, that the large companies are already flat in emissions. But again, um, if you work through back of the envelope, even the growth of institutional holdings, you would not expect that institutional holding carbon footprint would have shrunk over the period. So that, the next question is, what about those committed institutions that join CDP and then later climate action, or those that do not join, the, the orange versus the blue? Um, and these are the numbers in those, um, you know, now, uh, for example, CDP signatories represent a, a majority of the AUM. We do is we take that footprint measure I just mentioned. So if you own one percent of the stock, you uh, have one percent of its emissions. If you look at the top uh, right uh, box there, we also look at other measures like intensity measures, etc., by unit of output, etc. But we focus more on the aggregate emissions, and then what you see is that there's decarbonization by blue and orange. But everything is decarbonizing, even the MSCI equity is decarbonizing, as I was suggesting. So the question is, who's decarbonizing faster? So just to uh, go straight to the point, what we then partition like differently from the first study is we find that the, the entities that are headquartered in countries that have, that have uh, carbon pricing schemes, are starting to decarbonize faster. And who are those? Mostly the EU, right? In, uh, investors that are based out of the EU. The EU has the emission trading scheme. Later, Japan introduces one in 2012 and Korea, et cetera. China is just about to introduce it uh, this last uh, two years, but that's outside of our study. So we look at those that are uh, in those uh, areas versus those that are not. And then you find that the left-hand side being what is the decarbonization rate, the change in your carbon emission metric year to year, we find the coefficient of the CDP, meaning a flag, whether you're a CDP signatory or not, is minus three, meaning you're decarbonizing 3% faster than the other, relative to the other investors. And to get to 20, uh, you know, if you go all the way back to, to the goals here, to get to here, you need to be decarbonizing at seven to eight percent per year. It gets harder and harder every year. You, you, if you delay, then it has to be nine percent next year. If you delay, it's ten percent next year, etc. If you delay it till the end of the century, then you have to decarbonize a hundred percent at the last year. So this three percent is a relatively economically important number. And then finally, how do you decarbonize? Are you decarbonizing by reweighting, uh, meaning you are sorry, you are moving your weights from brown to green or are you engaging with the brown companies and staying investing with the brown companies uh, to, um, uh, to to help them transition so on that we find mostly the the left we find mostly it's uh, greening your portfolio and that is by looking at the delta the changes in the weights versus the, the changes in emissions and seeing that most of the action seems to be on the changes in, in the portfolio weights, not in the changes in the corporate emissions. And finally, that part on, um, um, you know, adoptions of, um, I showed you before, of, uh, you know, renewable energy, electrical vehicles, et cetera. We, we did some, have some results there, but we mostly find some tilting not some engagement on companies to develop new technologies, green patents, or green revenues. Again, this is work in progress. And, you know, uh, the main uh, message here is you're mostly greening the portfolio, not helping green the planet. And it sort of raises the, con the, the concern that, yeah, you could not be greenwashing because you're greening your portfolio. That's, you know, what you're trying to achieve, but you may not be addressing that sustainable development goal the, the climate uh, action. Lots of uh, work on this, on tilting in and tilting away, on you know what effect would this have? Uh, you know the fact that you're tilting away with this through a cost of capital raise the cost to the brown companies. Will the brown companies uh, you know transition, or would it make it hard for the brown companies to transition? Uh, lots of other work also on other asset classes. So to conclude, I, I wanted to give you two. Uh, messages. One was 
beware of greenwashing. And now I am think we all are responsible for academics and practitioners to examine these issues and, and you know, uh, these issues could be resolved by some regulation, could also be addressed by our pressure. But even if you do walk the ESG talk or and you green your portfolio, as I showed you in the second study, we should all, all not really wear, care whether you do ESG or not, it's whether you actually achieve the ESG goal or not. And that is much harder to assess. Many other uh, topics are out there. Um, the politicization, anti-ESG backlash on this, many other dimensions beyond climate change on E, our diversity, the number of studies are coming out on that. Uh, the regulations I mentioned, are they being effective or not? And will this, you know, focus on, for example, climate lead to social costs, or do we have a problem of just transition? I will just close with one advertisement, which is, um, as I mentioned, we're now involved with the PI uh, academic network. So June and I were, for example, at the last event in Tokyo around the PI in person. You can join some events online as well. There's a, a, a a webinar series and our next one is Itai Goldstein in January um, and you can also join us next year uh, where the, the conference will be in Toronto. So with those, uh, thank you for allowing me to do some of this advertising. I'm very uh, much looking forward to the Q&A discussion with Janet and I also look uh, forward to many other talks in the series. So I'll stop sharing and turn it back to Janet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pedro. You ended just on time. And uh, there are already lots of questions queuing up in the Q&A session. And so I'm going to ask uh, some of these questions. Let me start with the questions in the pre-lecture um, um, poll. And because there are some questions with commonality. Um, so one of the questions I think is kind of repeated is the effects of greenwashing on the anti-ESG political backlash and um, relatedly, one of the audience members asked, do you see green hushing becoming more popular in the US in the near future? Do you see this as a hindrance to the prevalence, uh, prevalence of ESG investing in the US or would it help actually help push the ESG initiatives in the regions where it is um, welcomed or politicized? So I think these are related questions about kind of the division in the view towards ESG, especially in the US. Yeah, I think those are great questions. The, you know, I don't think greenwashing helps promote ESG investing. Uh, it does undermine some trust on the effectiveness of ESG investing. Um, it is used sometimes as ESG not being sincere and fuels that anti-ESG backlash you mentioned. Um, it also, but it, you know, on the positive side, it has led to some regulatory scrutiny and this may be a good time to you know create the standards rules and checks now i'm not a, apologies of every type of regulation rule and check but uh, this is like um, a good a good place to do so and since it's still unfolding i think in the long run maybe this standards rules and checks then can actually you know strengthen the credibility the effectiveness of the of the ESG initiative. So it's like I'm I'm copying out, but I'm I'm thinking it's actually you have to be honest about you know greenwashing and that you know and some of some somewhat legitimate concerns from anti ESG uh, backlash, such that you can actually improve the you know the this. And it is important that a lot of the you know that people get a, a choice and then they're provided the choice. So if you are participating in a pension plan or uh, et cetera, that you get pulled and your preferences are reflected into your investments. That's something that in Europe that is, you know, it's it, that goes alongside with, with the rollout of ESG is also that you should be asking uh, the, the investors themselves if they want to, you know, tilt their, their investments in, in that direction. Sure. Um, and the next question, um, again, it's common question, common theme. It's related to the measurement. 
So one of the audience members asked, um, are the emission numbers accurate given that companies are voluntarily disclosing them? Um, relatedly, prior to the lecture, there was a um, question in the poll that other, if we don't rely on ESG metrics, then how else can we measure the real effects of ESG investing? What is the effectiveness of this strategy? Yeah. Yeah, I think the, you know, it is a promote a promising to have, you know, the development of this ESG ratings and all, but they're provided by various agencies. They do provide, they do vary in their criteria and the, and there's some in inconsistency or, or confusion that might come from that, may make it hard to compare companies. But I think this is actually a natural market <laughs> development. And you don't want also all equity analysts to think the same way, right? You want differing up, uh, views on, on, on issues. And so I think it's more what you said, the accuracy, uh, some, you know, some concerns around accuracy, completeness, timeliness of the data, and companies may be, you know, uh, selectively disclosing. Um, so there's this efforts to standardize the reporting. Those those would be important. Um, I think you you do you did mention also that that ultimately, and I you know, I think there are some products that tr try to give you SDG alignment. They're they're very they're very hard to measure, like how your investments are actually helping address climate change, nutrition, gender parity. You know, uh, social uh, justice, etc. So, if you look at seventeen sustainable development goals, those are harder to measure. Some of those things are not even right now uh, measurable, let's say. But I, I think that is, I think the ultimate goal of initiatives like the the PI and and so forth is that we get to a place where we have uh, the ability to, you know, the data uh, to to get to to all these these questions. Uh, I think there are other concerns, not just uh, beyond the ratings and the measurement. There are concerns with proxy advisors, uh, you know, that um, a lot of um, uh, investors may be outsourcing their responsibilities here in terms of uh, their engagement and their voting. Uh, there's some concerns that a lot of, uh, I think in my mind, a lot of times this products get sold, you do well, you know, and do good. Uh, and there's no, no, um, you know, that's not what finance theory would suggest, which is that you should expect a lower returns for ESG products. So, th so that you can actually achieve those uh, sustainable ESG goals. Um, and it's not clear to the investors how much they're willing to sacrifice the, in terms of returns. Because during the time period where we've observed this, there's been a rush to, of money into the space. And so green strategies were doing really well up till a year ago or so, and now they're kind of unraveling. So we, we really need to clarify also, not just how to measure and quality and consistency of measurement, what, what performance expectations should, should be there. Uh, and, you know, the as I mentioned, the regulatory environment is still evolving. Uh, so it is, you know, it is still hard, I think, to for many investors to navigate this uncertainty or uh, in the in the regulatory space. So there's more issues than just uh, measurement issues. But I think it's it's good that we study all all of them uh, uh, to bring more light into them. Mm, okay, thank you. Uh, so there are two new questions that pop up on the screen, and I think they're sort of related as well. One is about uh, would in the inclusion of scope three mission address the problem that, um, that listed companies only account for a fifth of the global CO2 emission? And the second one is perhaps more um, a, a, a tougher question. Is it appropriate to penalize investors for greenwashing? Mm -hmm. The first question, I think it's, it is uh, a great question. I think the, um, we did in the study only look at um, scope one emissions, direct emissions. That's also what most investors report. If you look into the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund, like when they report GPIFs, carbon footprint, et cetera. Um, but um, but m the majority like of the oil and gas emissions come later when you burn the oil and the gas, right? For That comes from downstream or uh, for example, for my 
you know iphone for example majority of the emissions come also a large part of it comes upstream when honhai or foxconn does it so um the sec was trying to attempt to <laughs> uh to get disclosure by corporates by corporations on on scope three it's it's not um it's not making progress of that that that, that was actually literally the the the, the you know right um the one that received the most comment letters, the proposal that's ever received ever more comment letters, because people are very, um, you know, um, very, uh, there's a lot of debate about how you measure it. Once you do, let's say you, you are able to do it, and we did it like, you shouldn't just add one plus two plus three, one being direct, two being purchase energy and heating, et cetera, and three being upstream, downstream, because there's some duplication. So for example, as I said, if you have, you know, Apple and the supply is Honhai or Foxconn, as we know it, then uh, we might be duplicating it. And the purchase power of, of Apple is also duplicate if the utility is also listed. So you have to undo some of that duplication and it is possible with input output matrices and and so forth to somewhat undo that but then janet gets into janet's work which is what if those emissions are outside public equities and that is um you know for example if honhai uses a, a supply in chengdu and uh, another chinese um supply that is not publicly listed so so it is uh you know then it's up to I think investors may expect uh, Apple to do that work to go upstream and downstream to figure out all that so that they can get, get reliable data. But I think that was um, that is a challenging thing because uh, I agree the 10 gigatons that 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 high number that small number I showed of the 50 gigatons is because mo the majority of the the um, the emissions might come downstream from our consumption or may come upstream from things that may not be produced by those this entities, the inputs and the, you know, that go into into this. Um, the second, remind me the second question, Janet, sorry. Yeah, is it appropriate to penalize investors for greenwashing? And I think the mm. question is also about, also well, should, should you penalize firms for greenwashing mm -hmm. as well? Mm. Um, I think we get we're at the early stages, so the PI might be a good example. And they decide not to penalize until a couple of years ago, and then they have finally kicked out some members. Their interpretation. Now, I'm not going to put words in their mouth, and I I don't mean to do that, but it's more like that they want to bring this tent, a lot of people into the tent, so that we we start getting the conversations going and processes and you know standards and measurement and you know um cons quality consistency etc into the process and then we can kind of penalize let's say or or give grades or whatnot um but uh, but i think we're still it's still good to bring uh, a lot of uh companies and investors in in the early stages of this such that um you know this is a truly a productive effort. If we start penalizing immediately, then you know that we may not have given time and uh, effort uh, for for the deployment of of ESG. So maybe for people who are more skeptical, they might say, "Well, Pedro, it's already been 10, 15 years, so it, it might be <laughs> time by now." Uh, whereas I'm, you know, it really depends what issue we're talking about. Like for example, biodiversity, we're at the very early innings of that. We want, but for maybe climate change, we are more, we have a, a better understanding of of uh, greenwashing in that in that context. Yeah, I think uh, also uh, one of the challenges um, is. The greenwashing by definition is very vague, right? It's hard to capture the true intention. Mm -hmm. So um, so there are several challenges that comes with it. First of all, for example, how you measure, how do yeah. you measure clearly the extent of greenwashing and how do you get to the intent of rather than, you know, um, just the action yeah. of it? Yeah, and there, it might be even hard to separate greenwashing from cheap talk, which is not, not, you know, ill intention talk, but versus the ill intent, as you said, Janet, I, I agree with you. Yeah. 
So I think we're close to the end of the session and uh, I'll hand it back to Jin. All right, thanks so much, Petro. Thank you, Janet. I think this is a well needed discussion and we're only at the beginning of it, right? So Petro already highlighted, maybe many of the investors are really picking the green firms and leaving out the brown firms, but to what extent you can make the green firm much greener while leave the brown firms even browner because they more brown because they don't have the resources. Is that the right direction we're heading for? Or to what extent the talk is aspirational that may lead the walk at some point <laughs> to how many years, how many months you should give these investors or SI owners to walk their talk. So these are probably bigger questions and we may need a little bit more time to address these important questions. I hope today's talk will give us the better you know, thoughts to start the next round of discussions, or maybe in the near future, we can revisit these problems either in terms of climate risk or social issues because there's a diversity washing paper as well. So they're looking at your walk and how does that uh, deviate from your, from, from your talk? So these are important topics. Uh, in the last minute, I'm going to feature the next um, public lecture. It is going to be the governance of certification agent. And here, Jess is going to touch on uh, the ESG rating agencies and the divergence of their ratings. Um, QR code is here. Uh, thank you again for supporting uh, the Caddy ICG. Thank you for attending our lectures. Thank you, Petro, and thank you, Janet. Thanks very much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. The recording will be posted and, and slides. Thank you. Bye. Okay.